What a wonderful day again to be in the house of God. We are so thankful and gracious that we are here and we are here in time. Today it's a special day. It's our visitors day and it's a world mission day. So I'm seeing my brother there. I'm not familiar with him. I guess he is our visitor this morning. He's, he's saying no, <laughs> but <laughs> he is not a visitor. Anyway, I'm sure. Okay. Our opening song is going to be number 369, May We Stand As We Sing. Gracious, kind and loving Father who is in heaven and here on earth. Father, we want to thank you this morning for your love, for your kindness, for keeping us in the week and bringing us to the house of worship in this morning. We thank you, dear Lord, for everything that you've done for us. Above all, we thank you, Father, for the gift of life because we wouldn't be here praising you. Lord, in this morning, I want to pray for those who could not make it to Sabbath school because they are not feeling well. We pray that may you remember them, dear Lord, in their sick bed. May you relieve them from pain, dear Lord, in a Sabbath day. We want to pray for those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones, dear Lord. We pray that may you reach out to them, touch them, dear Lord. May they feel your presence and your comfort in their lives, dear Lord, to know that they are not alone, you are with them. Father, we pray this morning that may you help those who are on the way who are coming, to worship, dear Lord, that may you help them, that they may get here in time. We thank you, Father, for everything, and we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit here. We pray, dear Lord, that we may have reverence, that we may listen to the message that you've prepared for us this morning. Speak to us, Lord, we are listening. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Yeah. Mm. 
Thank you, Sabah School members. I'm going to hand over to Brother Wilson, our PM leader. Thank you. Happy Sabah Church. Uh, right now, to those who are watching online, welcome as well. Thank you for choosing Claremont. Today is the Personal Ministries Day, where we are focusing on uh, mission and also love with hope. Um, Claremont Church, it has been an active church that has done much work on mission. And the, I'm going to One, two, one, two, testing, okay. So I'm going to show you some projects that Claremont Church has been supporting outside this country. Um, from around 2012, 2013, Claremont started supporting a church in Namibia, and the, that church was completed. A few years later, around 2015, they also joined a project that was... Um, happening in Malawi. And uh, this church, um, it was at the window level. And uh, they started looking for help. So later on, they got some help from Claremont Church. I'm going to read Haggai 1 verse 8. The Bible says, go up to the mountain and bring wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So God wants to be worshipped, not in the way we think, but he has got set a way he wants to be worshipped. He wants us to worship him in a sanctuary, in a well-built structure. So as you can see, that church, it is how it is at the moment. But Claremont Church adopted it when this church was at this level. Claremont Church put some money through donations. It was at that level. People were sitting in church in that way. Having an umbrella in the church because there was no roof. But God says, building me a sanctuary where I can rejoice and have, and have my name be glorified, where I can have pleasure in it. So when you are supporting mission projects, you are not wasting your resources. You are bringing the name of God into glory. You are making God to have pleasure in it. So that is the Mwinjo project that is found in the Blantyre City East in Malawi. You can see... People were sitting whatever they can bring in that place. You can see the pie finders doing their activities while standing on the scorching of the sun. Now, at this juncture, the church has been finished. That is how it looks inside. The people who are sitting in the sun, they are now sitting under a roof, and they are sitting on the floor because they are on the project of buying the benches. And when I went there in, in October, I joined this congregation, and I also had to sit on the floor because there are no chairs there. Those are the chairs that they managed to get while they are waiting for the 
uh, benches. During the contributions, uh, the women are contributing more than the men. <laughs> so the first two forms, the benches they made, they put them on the side of women because they are contributing more. <laughs> so our fellow men are sitting like that because they are failing to contribute more. <laughs> but still, they are worshiping God. Those are the benches which they want to fill the whole church. They want, I think, around 38 or 40 benches of that type. And uh, one bench is costing 1,952 rand. Yet, the majority of those people, they are people who just sell sweets along the streets at the bus stations, they sell bananas. For them to find the money to fill the church with the chairs, it will take some years. And they are pleading for all wishes to join them. Maybe donating a bench, maybe two people contributing, donating a bench. Whatever people can contribute, they, are, they will be very, very uh, appreciative. After the Hurricane Freddy, Fre Freddy or Freddy uh, took place in Malawi, Clement Church did not stay idle as well. Clement Church heard about it and they joined hands, the youth, the elderly, they brought together. Some were bringing clothes, some were bringing cash, and the, those are the parcels that we packed. And we collected some parcels even from Westlake SDA Church. They joined hands. And we are very appreciative. We, I arrived in Malawi, then we had to drive long distance to go to the villages where this Hurricane Friday took place and lots of people lost their items and even their homes. You can see from those mountains, water basted on top of that mountain and swept almost the whole village. And we reached at the headquarters of the paramount chief of that area who welcomed us. That, is, that structure is the court, and he, the court was in session, but he, she left it and joined us to go to the ground where people were gathering. You could see people were waiting there because we told them we are coming, and the five villages were brought together. There were people of all ages. The elderly were there. The young women were there. They were all waiting that what are we going to get since we lost everything. So that was the chief who, who welcomed us, and she spoke to the people, introducing us to the community there. And those are the luggages we took from here to Malawi. And we had to take a symbolic picture for the chief to keep in his office. And the disaster management aid was also there. Um, and uh, we had few blankets that were also donated, and uh, we had to choose whom should we give the blanket amongst all these people, because there were many. And uh, that was one of the blankets that we took out of the bags, and uh, we identified the recipient, that old lady. When she received that blanket, she said, oh, today I'm going to be a human being. I had almost shed my tears because she has been sleeping without a cover. So the, whatever you think you can give out to support somebody, you are not wasting it, but you are changing a life of somebody. And you are bringing pleasure to God as God has said in Haggai 1 verse 8. So the, lady, the old lady received her blanket and the those are the clothes that we collected, and some bags were just behind. And we had to make a system now. How are we going to distribute these things? And we decided that each person is going to come forward and take two. And they had a good system that they wrote villages down, and they were calling 
village by village, and people were coming forward to collect the items. You can see the, the brother there was receiving his portion, and uh, while others were still waiting. And uh, at the end, that was the team that went there to, to help us. And uh, uh, this brother is the one who transported us there. And uh, this lady is the one who was coordinating with the chief to gather the villages to bring us together. And this one is uh, brother Steve and his sister Miriam. They are all um, the members of our church there. Lastly, the project that also has been supported by Claremont Church. It is the Mlombo's Seventh-day Adventist Church. This church, it was being built during the COVID. It was tough to find people who can respond to the request of this church. So when they sent me the message saying, we have got this project and the rain is just almost two months away, if we don't complete it, we don't know where we are going to be gathering. And this is the oldest church in the area where I come from. And this, church, this place is where I set my food for the first time into Adventist church. Because one of my friends invited me there. And I even remember the sermon that was preached that day. It is a long time back, around 1990 or 1989. So this church was also at the window level when they said, we need some help. So Claremont Church was not gathering because of the COVID. What I did, I just put their, the pictures of their church on my WhatsApp status. And people saw it, and then they started asking, where is this? How can we help? Then some members donated some funds during the COVID. And the, this church was completed during the COVID, before the rains started. It is only that small canopy that is remaining that they have not yet found some iron sheets to complete it. And the, at the moment, this church, you can see it's a small congregation, and those are farmers, they are in the rural area, and there was a drought this year in their area. They have nothing to sell to contribute to church building. They are putting the floor now. By the grace of God, one lady who is the member of parliament in that area, she is a Catholic. But she came to this church and gave a testimony that one time back, she was, her house was located to the place where Adventists used to have a camp meeting. And after work, she was going to sit there and learn what the Adventists believe, but she's a Catholic. So she said she learned a lot from family life teachings. And she was celebrating her 50th year in marriage following the principles she learned from the Adventist teachings. She came to this church and donated 100 bags of cement, a Catholic lady. But now the bags are there. For the church to put the floor, they needed to raise funds. And to, for the fear that the cement can dry, because if it stays longer, it can dry and be useless. Some volunteers, they said, we are going to do the work. You will pay us later. So volunteers at the moment are working, but there is no money to pay them. They are waiting that one day the church will pay them if they raise the funds. So God is calling his church that they must come together, go to the mountain, bring the poles, bring the stones, bring the rocks, bring everything, the nails together, and build him a place of worship. So when we are rallying together, when we are putting our hands together to build the church, to support other churches, we are supporting the work of God. You are not supporting the work of someone else. It is the work of God. And uh, another church, these are the church leaders. Uh, 
this brother, he was baptized in 2011 after I conducted a campaign in this area. And when I went home, he is the first elder at this church. So when we are doing the work of God, believe that God is in it. When we are supporting the work of God, just believe that God is in it. And God is going to bless us because we are doing what he has asked us to be doing. Uh, for today, let us, from today, let us remember Haggai 1 verse 8, that God is commanding us to go. Bring whatever we can, to, we can and build his church so that he can find pleasure and his name be glorified in it. Amen. What does the church say to that wonderful message of the gospel of God being spread throughout the world and reaching people at their point of need and also spiritually? May God continue to bless us. At this point in time, I'm going to take some birthday offerings and thanks offering. If there are any who need to give some offering, please raise up your hand. I'll come to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. May we stand as we sing our closing song. Three, five, eight. Three, five, eight. Three, five, eight.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we say thank you for bringing us together in this sanctuary, and we thank you for speaking to us that we can go and support your work. We pray, Lord, that as we go into the lesson for today, allow the Holy Spirit to be with our teachers so that whatever you have imparted unto them, they may impart it unto us. Guard us so and guard those who are on the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, PM leader, and the work that is being done by the church throughout the world. We thank God for using his people. May we continue to support the ministry in doing the God's work. At this point in time, we're going to separate to our classes. We've got an adult class here. We've got a youth class behind the class. We've got another adult class in the library. We've got kindergarten behind the foyer. Baptismal class in the in the hall, and then disciple class upstairs in the pastor's office. Kids and correctly, I mean primary, junior, and all the other classes are upstairs. May we separate our classes? Thank you. Happy Sabbath, Church. I can see we still have a few people in the foyer that are coming in, so we'll give them a minute. that you all had a good week. That's good. I'm, see a, I'm seeing a lot of heads shaking. So that's a good thing. It means everyone had a good week. Amen. Okay, let's, I think let's kick off. Um, so we'll start with a word of prayer. Let's close our eyes and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you've brought us here today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. As we get into your word, Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us, open up our hearts, open up our minds for us to learn and for us to absorb your teachings, Lord. Thank you, Lord, and thank you for this wonderful Sabbath. Amen. So our lesson is a very difficult one. <clears throat> um, the great controversy. It's, it's it challenged me this week when I was preparing. Um, it's a very challenging lesson. Um, because it, it, it highlights our, our shortcomings. Um, and, and I think, like in anything in life, when, when, when someone highlights your blind spots or your shortcomings, it's never a comfortable topic. Um, we, we do that a lot, even at work, when we start doing Enneagrams and this and that, because they want to develop you to make you a better leader and better this and better that. And when they start highlighting those blind spots, it's very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. Because we all like to believe we're perfect. <laughs> we all like to believe that we don't have blind spots. Um, wait until you get married. Then they'll be highlighted all the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, okay, so our lesson is, is, is lesson two, which is um, the central issue, um, love and, and selfishness, or love, love or selfishness. Um, yeah, uh, this, this topic really challenged me this week. Um, let's start with our memory text. Our memory text is from Isaiah 41, verse 10, and it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a powerful, powerful, powerful um, piece, of, piece of text there. But what does, what does it mean? I mean, it's, 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 it's what, what does it mean to you? Um, because, because, you know, because we all have our different experiences and different challenges, this text will probably mean different things to us. So what does this text mean to you? Uh, Elder V, can you help with the, with the, oh, you got it, thank you, behind you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Sabbath. When it says, uh, fear not, that tells you that uh, there is something or someone around who brings fear to you. Okay, so there is an existence of something or someone that creates fear mm. around you. But it's telling you, fear not. Fear not. Mm. It's telling you that you can carry on with confidence. If you do the right thing, mm. you have the protection around you. Thank you. Amen for that. You. Good morning, everybody. Morning. What I noticed, the five eyes, I will be, I will. God is repeating himself what, what he alone can do. And so before you went into that, I just explained it this morning. I felt very bad listening and reading, seeing what Jesus is doing, has done, and where I am. But God is still saying, let me do it for you. I've done it for you. And I cannot help but see Ezekiel 20, 28, where the eyes, somebody else is speaking, and he mentions five eyes too. Yeah. I will be like the most, I, I will ascend, I will, and that's his opposite. It showed the jealousy Lucifer has for God, mm -hmm. because God alone can bring this to pass. Amen. Amen. One more hand. Thank you. Um, for me personally, you know, God is perfect. And whenever something bad happens, that's what is the lesson is bringing out. Whenever something bad happens, people always question and mm. say, if God is so perfect, if God is so good, why are all these bad things happening? And I'm not going to run ahead of you in the <laughs> lesson, so I'm not going to answer that question. But here is the promise that God is making to us. And I'm, I'm going to say for me personally, you know, in a world that is not perfect, in my life that is not perfect, there are so many things that I wish could be different. Yeah. You know, and where I'm asking God, please help me with this. But where God is saying, I am your God. Mm. I will uphold you. Mm. And I will help you no matter what you are going through. Absolutely. And that is, that is something that means so much to me. Mm. Because... Anyway, Thank, thank, thank you for that, and thank you for bringing the emotion, um, because that's exactly what this lesson is about. Thank you. Um, you know, when words like I'm with you, I said the relationship between you and the person saying it also counts. Mm. So if, um, for example, if I just take it to a work situation, if I trust my boss, and we have a big presentation or something, he says, just relax, I'm with you, you know? <laughs> but if I know that he's always trying to throw me under, or if the history between us tells me that I might be the one sacrificed, those words will not mean much. Absolutely. So that, you know, you've been called 
when someone says fear not, they're asking you to do the opposite, have mm. faith, but mm. you're having faith in who? What you have as an underlying relationship, so I think Sister Sharon was also touching on, will, 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 will be the foundation of, of why you will believe those words exactly. when it says, I am exactly. with you. So I think uh, it also calls upon us to investigate what is the relationship between us and the person saying these words, the one mm -hmm. that says, I am your God. Absolutely. Viewer? I think to me, it just is, uh, don't be discouraged. Heaven is on your side. Mm -hmm. I always, when, whenever that, that word comes, heaven is on your side. Mm -hmm. No matter how... how how I do not see clearly before me, and I feel like I'm anxious or anything. Heaven is on our side. Amen. Amen. One more hand at the back. And this one. Oh, sorry. I'll come to you just now. I missed that. <laughs> when I read this verse, I see action. It's not just saying, sit there. He's saying, I'm with you, I'm accompanying you, because he's holding your hands for the action. Are we getting it? Yes. There's action. It's not saying, sit there. You're not doing anything. Yeah. Thank you. So it's love in action, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. I also love this verse. It's my go-to verse. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, I, I think I read... Um, the other version, I'm not sure which, which one is it. It said, uh, victorious right hand. So I've added now to righteous, victorious right hand, because the victory has already been won for me. I love that, uh, because that victory is assured. Yeah. That victory is assured. It's, it's, it's such a powerful verse to start off this, les this lesson that... that um, <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, it, it's such a powerful verse that I feel like closing my laptop and sitting down because, because discussing this verse and what it means to everyone is, is essentially the gist of, of this lesson. But maybe let me just share with you what I got out of this verse. Um, I mean, you don't have to agree, but it's what I got out of it. Um, I picked up four promises. I picked up four promises from this, from this word, from this verse that God is making to us. The first one, He says, "I am with you." That's a promise. That's a guarantee. He's not saying, "I'm maybe with you." No, He says, "I am with you." That's a guaranteed promise. The next one says, "I am your God." He's not saying maybe. It's a guarantee. I am your God. And the next one says, I will strengthen you. It says, I will help you. Which means that he's still making a promise that it doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter what challenges we are facing. He is with us. And the last one is, I will uphold you. Which means that we need to have faith and be guaranteed of the fact that God will never let us down. Unlike us humans, we are always letting each other down. God will never let us down. And, and, and these promises are essentially love in action. They are love in action. But we'll get, we'll get to the part where we talk about love and, and we talk about selfishness as well because I think it, it, ties, up, it ties up very nicely. Let me jump to an extract from Wednesday, but I'll bring it into the introduction, where God says, well, not God, but the, the, the writer says, in the great controversy raging in the universe, the devil wants to deface the image of God in humanity. The purpose of the gospel is to restore the image of, human, of God in humanity. 
The restoration includes physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. And this is an extract, like I said already, it's an extract from Wednesday, and I thought it was important to bring it into, into our introduction as we lay the foundation of, 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 of this lesson. So let's move on to Sabbath. Let's move on to Sabbath as, as part of the introduction. We have read um, in Sabbath that the devil is essentially employing a two-pronged strategy. Um, if there's nothing we can take away from him, is that he's a strategist, he's a tactician. Yeah, he plans, he plans these things. Um, and and, and one, of, one of the strategies that he's employing is, is deceit. Let's define deceit. So by definition, what is deceit? What is deceit by definition? Let me, let me, let me, let me help us quickly. So, so deceit is essentially a combination of two things, error and truth. That's essentially the definition of deceit. And that is why even the elect are getting deceived because in everything that the devil does, there's an element of truth. There's always an element of truth, and that is why even the very elect are getting deceived. And that is why the Bible says, study to show yourself approved, right? Because if we don't do that, we'll be deceived. And that is why when we are deep in sin, there's always that element of justification. We are always trying to justify what we are doing and, and why we are doing it. Uh, that's, that's the devil playing in our minds and essentially saying to you, oh, but this is not too bad. This is not too bad until you're deep in it and it's very difficult to come out. So that's, that's, that's essentially the definition of deceit, error and truth mixed together. Then, then the other part of the strategy that he's employing, which is the scary one, is that he wants to destroy us. There's, there's, no, there's, there's no two ways about it. The devil wants to destroy us. So his strategy, deceit, destroy. That's a strategy. So that's essentially the essence, really, of, 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 of Sabbath. I don't know if there's any comments on Sabbath. I want to jump into Sunday. This, this lesson is so, so intense that I actually don't want to miss a day. So do, I do apologize if it, it comes across as though I'm, I'm, I'm rushing. But Sabbath, Sister Shereen. Sorry, Brother Sachaba. I also wanted to, the other strategy, I don't know if that falls in with deceit, mm. but the, the, the fact of compromise. Mm. That really struck me because we don't give up our truth completely, mm. but the fact that we compromise, that is also a way, because that is actually worse, because the devil knows he can't draw us away completely. Yep. But he said, just compromise on one thing. Yes. And he got us. Exactly. Exactly, and that's a very powerful point around compromising, and that's that's something that we as Christians do a lot. I was I was watching. A, I'm I'm a, I'm a huge soccer fan, so I was watching one of the Liverpool games in the week. I don't, I don't want to talk about soccer, but anyway, I was watching one of the games, and what struck me about that game is at some point they stopped playing for about maybe two three minutes. They stopped playing, and I was wondering well, what's going on. Why would they stop in the middle of a game? And, and, and they walk to the sidelines and then two, three minutes later they're back on. Until the commentator came on and said, um, you know, because of, of, of Ramadan and Eid, the Muslim players had to go break fast, drink water, come back and play. And I said, wow, if, 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 if the world can take certain religions that seriously, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong? The fact that a whole game can be stopped so that they can observe something. Um, what that essentially told me is that because Muslims, and they, they take themselves seriously and they take their religion seriously, and they're not shy about it. And that is why the world takes them seriously. And maybe the question is, do we, especially Adventist Christians, do we take ourselves seriously enough for the world to recognize who we are, what we are about, and what we believe in. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I'll, I'll leave you to ponder um, on that question. Any other comments on Saturday, on Sabbath, before I move on to Sunday? No, okay, good. I think we'll, we'll move on to, to Sunday. A broken-hearted savior. Wow, 
um, that, that, that just that heading alone, before I even got into the reading, broke my heart. Because, you know, we, we often don't realize how much, how much Jesus still suffers, not even suffered, still suffers on, 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 on our behalf. We, we almost tend to treat God as, a, as an object with, with no feelings. Um, and, and that is why we continue doing what we're doing. I cannot help but run for that. He came to his own, and his own received him not. John 11. Yep. And we say John it's 1, so 11. easy. But you know, Afrikaans has a beautiful, beautiful proverb. I wish everybody could speak and understand what it says. As your eye want your bite, bite your disaster. Now let me say what it's saying. <laughs> if your other dogs bite you, you expect it. It can be accepted and be explained. But if your own dog does it, that's where the pain comes from. Yeah. Because you love him, cares for him, you buy his food, you do everything. And yet, he's the one that bites you. Mm -hmm. When these words are so easily said, I came to my own, my, my own, own received me not. Mm -hmm. But as we go through the lesson, and as we look at Isaiah 53 and 22 in, in Psalms, we can really, really see the agony that Jesus suffers and will ever will because his cause will never leave him. Yeah, absolutely. That expression does not have the same impact when you say it in English. It had that right impact in, in Afrikaans. I liked it. Um, Let's, 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 let's you've, you've, you've in fact led us on to um, John 1, verse 11. So can we read that verse, um, if, if someone has it? John 1, verse 11. If you have it, please read it. John 1 verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Can you imagine you've been away from home for a long time, and you decide to go visit, and they don't receive you? How would that make you feel? I mean, the story here that talks about how Jesus was sitting at the Mount of Olives, looking at Jerusalem and thinking, you're going to be destroyed, how that felt. And the question that I started asking myself is, come with me a little bit. Let's, let's paint a picture. Um, and we've got a visitor. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's, let's, let's paint a picture of, of Claremont Church. And, and God is sitting at the top of Table Mountain and is looking at Claremont Church. What is he thinking? What, what is he, yeah, what, 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 what is he thinking? If, if we inspect our own lives at the moment, do you think he's sitting there watching the church and thinking, you are going to be saved? Or is he sitting there watching the church and thinking, my dearest Claremont Church, you are going to be destroyed. What is he thinking? I'm sorry, it seems everybody through this lesson, I, I don't think, I think this is the crux of the whole lesson, hmm. the weeks to come. Because when he sat there, he says, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, you kills the prophets, I send them to warn you. And you kill them and stone them. I send them to give you a message. I send them to let you know that I love you. Mm. But what did you do? You killed them. You stoned them. You, Oh, Jerusalem. And then he says the words that the others heard him say. You know, people are very what they want to hear, what they want to say. And when he said not one stone will be left upon another, what does he mean? He can throw this temple that took so many years to build. Was that what Jesus was saying? No, he was looking at the spiritual needs. Mm. 
how hopeless they made their own condition. I'm here among you now to show you how to live. It's not impossible. I can do it. You can do it too. Because I will do it for you. Yep. So Absolutely. Uh, Sister Melina. Uh, the said the said the said the part is that um when god uh speak to us and show us the way we tend not to listen but when bad things come to us because of our disobedience the first question is where is god yeah. why am i going through all this yeah. we, we bring it back to him yet it is our fault that we we don't listen, we choose the other way, we choose uh, the devil yeah. who deceives us, who doesn't uh, show us the right way to, to go. Yeah, remember his ultimate goal is to destroy. It's to destroy. It, it, it almost feels like history is repeating itself, right? Yeah, it, it almost feels like history, history, history is repeating itself because I can tell you now, when God is Wherever he's sitting at the moment, he's watching and thinking, oh, my children, I love you so much, but you are not listening. You are not obeying. You are going to be destroyed. It feels like history is repeating itself. Let's go to Matthew 23, verse 37, then I'll come to you, Sister Eleanor. Matthew 23, 37. Twenty-three, verse seven. Thirty-seven. Sorry. If you have it, please read for us. Matthew twenty-three, verse thirty-seven. Yes. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often will I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicken under her wings, and you would not. And that's the verse you were referring to. Um, Mike? Sorry, thank you. My, my daughter and I have fights when the news is on. When I go to f news, you know, and I want to see the fr in, fr in France <laughs> the news when they put it on. And then she said, remember the children. There's children involved. This week's lesson, I looked, I said, Jesus saw what was going to happen, what he had caused. Mm. The blood of innocent babes and children that flowed. Sister White writes, she said the blood ran like water. Mm. Can you stop water when it's running? The blood flowed like that. Everybody who passed by. I want us to be, come away and ask God, give me a picture. Maybe if we had a picture, we will understand it better. Yeah. But he's wanting us to see the picture. That is why he's making that illustration about, oh, like the hen covers a little chicks when they kicked in the fire when the house was out and they kicked it into the farm. When they kicked the little pile that was lying there, it was the feathers that was burnt, but the chicks was underneath it, mm. came running out alive. Yes. Isn't it amazing? The blood that flowed, only God knows. That children who died, imagine it's mine, imagine it's yours. Mm. What would we give to yeah. save them? Yeah. What would we do? And here God is saying, this is about to happen again. If we are not studying, we will not be ready yeah. Yeah. for the dark days that's about to come. A time such as never was since there was a nation. If God is speaking about that, what's going to happen now? And, and the whole concept of gather under your, un, un, under your wings, the whole concept of gathering under wings emanates from love, right? So because of God's love, he's gathering us under his wings. But remember, you have to be willing. You have to be willing. So, so and, and that's the beauty of love. Love, we know God is love, but love gives you a choice, Right? So if, if, if you are not willing to be gathered under those wings, God is not going to force you. 
God is not going to force you. And, and in fact, if he did force you to be gathered under those wings, that's not a sign of love. God loves us so much that he gives us the choice. He gives us that choice. Sister Eleanor? You know, um, for some time now, I've been contemplating the, the, how God feels, how much we don't realize um, when we evaluate his suffering emanating, coming from our, our disobedience. And, and I, begin, I began to, as you know, as you interact with your own children, you realize God created that, 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 that parent, fam, parent child analogy, you know, to have us, have him, have us refer to him as father, you know, to create that parent child relationship. Um, as a parent myself, you get a glimpse of how God, I, and I say a glimpse because we are finite, a glimpse of how God, how much God suffers in, in terms of our, you know, because of a, our disobedience, because he's putting every single parameter in place and it is to save us, it is to guard us, it is to, it is 100% for our own good. I would dare to say there's nothing in it for him. But then when we disobey, then he really, because he's eternal, I was just thinking about it, whereas I will feel pained, you know, from my own child's um, disobedience, but um, it, it cannot compare to the pain he feels in eternity because he's eternal. Um, so that's, that's the one. And then this other one of Israel of old, he did everything. He dug, he sent prophets, he spoke. He even gave a parable to the leaders in Israel that servants were sent to you, you killed them. Until finally he sent his son, just in case. They would take a few steps back and say, finally he sent his son to us. And what did they do? They say, ah, this one is going to be an heir. Well, let's catch him and kill him. You know? And then you can, you can look at it as if it were far removed from our own reality. And that the question is, what are we still doing on planet Earth until now? Until since this movement was raised to give that loud cry, to give that last message so that we can actually hasten his coming, why are we still here? And then you get to a situation where you realize um, as you read the compile, the book, the testimonies, the testimonies are the testimonies not for other people, but it's for the church. And you see the brokenness within Adventist homes in the testimonies. And then you today, 100 years later, can relate directly to that. Then you begin to appreciate that, whereas you can read it in scripture and say, Israel of old was too stubborn. I think we need to just realize that we are not, we are not really different yeah. from what they are doing. And that's why we're still marking time today. Yeah. We are not giving the message the way it's supposed to be given because we are still, I, I dare to say for myself, worse than Israel. So in essence, what you're saying is we are delaying his coming. Let me go to Marco, then I'll come to you, Elder V. Okay, I'll try to keep it short. No um, just over two years, this was one of my big questions before I became an Adventist. If God is so supreme, why so much suffering? Mm. You know, then I came across, and thank God, I, I met a lady by the name of Ellen White. She gave us beautiful writings. But she, she used this phrase that the reason why there's so much suffering is because of our uh, insubordination. Yep. You know, that's a powerful word. There is a job for us to do. You know, when I reflect back on Luke 21 verse 20, 
The children of Israel were given warnings time and time again. We always tell our children, strike one, strike two, strike three. God is giving in his mercy, he's giving us warnings. When he shall see the Roman soldiers encompass Judea, let he flee into the mountains. Mm. These are warnings. When I read then uh, Daniel 12, verse 11 and 12, the abomination of desolation. When I read Luke, uh, Matthew 24, verse 15 to 20, you know, I'm stuck with Sunday study. It's a powerful one. But this is warnings for us. We are now looking for when church and state comes together, when God's law is made void, that is the abomination. Stand in the holy place. Yep. You know, let ye flee into the mountains. My question is, are we willing to make that same mistake that the children of Israel made that hearkened not to the warning of God that were destroyed men, women, and children by the thousands? Mm. The writer says that God looked with tears in his eyes as they were destroyed. That yep. was not part of his plan. Yep. They hearkened not to his warning. Inspiration says, Alan White says, not one Christian that listened to the warning to flee perished. Yep. My question is, are we willing to hearken to that warning and leave the big cities? Amen. I, I love how you brought um, Sunday together because I was actually going to go to Matthew 24, 15 to 20. You've brought it uh, together nicely, so I'm not even going to attempt to, to mess with it. Um, in fact, that part where, where, where it talks about God had tears in his eyes, Ellen White then says, those tears were not for himself. Those tears were not for himself. Those tears were for you and I. Those tears were for you and I. Brother Viewe and then Brother Francois. All right. Um, when I, I hear this verse um, that um, he came to his own, but they received him not, mm. I just think of a God who's, who's familiar with um, rejection mm. and um, who is used to... Um, to know when people are cons when people constantly say no and no and no, um, you will tend to doubt yourself. I mean, even uh, children of today, uh, maybe uh, let me not let me say children of today. It can happen. I mean, when we're younger as well, um, when you constantly um, receive rejection, that sometimes will, uh, will kind of just shape you on how you think about yourself and everything. But we, we, we serve a God that is different. <laughs> that, um, in my language, it says, Olanda which is, He does not get tired. His love is stubborn. Um, whether you are saying no, He respects your choice, but He loves you anyway. Even in the Old Testament, it says, My people have committed two sins, they have forsaken me, the fountain of the living waters and hewn themselves systems, broken systems that yield no waters. God is, is, is familiar with rejection. Uh, but we, we, we are grateful that we, we, are, we, are, we are serving a God who, who is not like a reed, um, who is not shaped by how you, you view him, but give it some time. He's long-suffering. And he's going to show you every day how beautiful he is and, why, why, and that which he wants for you. And, and you. everything that everyone has been saying is the true definition of love. And, and that is why God is love. So I'm glad that all the comments that have been coming through have been defining what love is. And they've been defining God. We'll get to selfishness shortly. Um, Brother Francois? I just want to, to, to go back to the, uh, John 11 that uh, we just read. He said, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Mm. But before that, uh, verse 5 said that, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Why does the light, or did the light, or does the light shine in darkness because darkness on its own will not appreciate that is in darkness mm. so light comes to darkness to tell darkness that you are in darkness mm. 
and you appreciate the beauty of being in the light. In the light. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So that's appreciating when we are sinning and that we need to come out of that sin. I think we've sufficiently covered Sunday. I'm looking at the time, so I think I need to move on to, to Monday. So Monday says, Christians providentially preserved. The writer was using big words, providentially. Um, what's, what's, uh, let's define it. What's, what's providentially? Um, where, where does that word come from? Providentially. Okay, we've got provide. What else? Preserved. Okay. So, so from 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 a little bit of research when when preparing, I, I then decided let me let me get the, the the definition of providentially, and and essentially what it says is biblically it says resulting from God's intervention. That's providentially, right? B biblically. But if you go to the normal dictionary, it's, it's actually a word that comes from, from a Latin word called providentia, which is foresight, precaution, or foreknowledge. That's, that's essentially what provi providential, providentially means. Which means then that if we were to change Monday's heading from Christians providentially preserved, we could say through God's foreknowledge, foresight and intervention, Christians are preserved, which means they are saved. Because he already knew what was coming. He knows what is coming. He's got that foresight, which is something that we don't have, right? I mean, in, 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 in the work environment and in business, they will always say that you need to come up with uh, strategies. Um, you need to have forecasts for the year. Um, and, and, and I mean, all of those forecasts and strategies that you're putting together, you, you're doing that in the dark because you're making assumptions, right? It's, it's, never, it's never a guarantee. So you will base it on, on history. So you will say, well, last year as a business, this is what we did. So, you know, this year, if we employ these strategies, this is what we will do. Um, but it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. But in this instance, God's intervention and foresight is guaranteed because he knows what the future holds. What I want to say about this providential thing that is being spoken about. God is my provider and all that. But you know what? I'm always asking when I studied Daniel and the image. Mm. And it's this in the leg part that represented Rome. And it was the only one with the terrible material made of. Because it's made of iron. Mm. Of iron. Yet Jesus, sorry, thank you. Yet Jesus chose to come and live in that area and in that time. Isn't it strange the Romans were in possession? They were ruling. But who's making the Romans run here for that little while? That is what is in this lesson. Mm. That Israel had a few moments where they could put their foot down mm. and had to acknowledge that the battle that they were fighting, they didn't fight and win. The battle that was won was God's battle. He battled, he won the battle for his people. Mm. And he was showing them, if you obey, this is just the start of many things. And running far ahead, I said, God, how could you do this? I mean, being born that you had to flee as a baby. We need to know all the stories. It's important. Yeah. When he was born, his mother had to flee. And his father, the angel said, take the child and run to where, to where we call the enemy land, mm -hmm. Egypt. But he ran, just like the instruction he gave. If you hear, run, run, hide, don't sit. Run to the mountains. It's my mountains. I know what can be there to provide for you, mm. for food, for being your protection. Looking. This is all the things that God see that we need to know. Yep. Not I want to know everything. 
It gives God a clearer understanding. It shows God, this mighty God. God, you are a, who's like you? Who is like you? Hmm. You are so different. And then you still love me. Who am I? It should humiliate us. It must make us more humble yeah. than what we are. That they could win for that little time to make the Romans that was in control run. <laughs> to me, I couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> in, in fact, there's an ex a bit of an extraction from, from Monday where it says that there will be times when the people of God experience hardship, persecution, imprisonment, and death. Then it says, but even in the most challenging of times with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his church. So what that tells me is that on our own, we can't do it. On our own, we can't do it. We need God. We need God for us to be able to be saved. We can't save ourselves. I'm at 20 past 10, so I'm going to dash to Tuesday. Did you want to say something, Sister Eleanor, before I close Monday? Yes, I was just thinking about Lord's experience. Um, when he is told exactly what the final destination for safety would be in the mountains, and he still made excuses and asked for, no, I just want to go to this other one because if I go there, I'm going to die. You know, that, there's that, when you look, read the account, every time I think about it, you realize, were it not for the faithful prayer of his uncle, Abraham, such that even to deliver them, they were actually pulled out, almost like forced out of destruction. And even then, you've been told your ultimate destination is the mountain. You still say, so I'm going to die there. I just want to go to this closer. And God in his providence already knew that even those closer cities were going to go off. Ultimately, he, he had to actually struggle to get to where he would have had a supersonic flight with the angels to take him to the mountain. He had to travel that, that, this, that, that a tedious path on his own, his own way, but that was the destination. So the, the call to flee, you know, when, when that obedience is, it's either strict obedience with the Lord is not, or no obedience at all. I think once we always in that dilly darling position, okay, is this really the sign? Is that not the sign? Is on the law what I should be waiting for before I get my act together? Or should I actually be ready so that I know, regardless of when the pressure mounts, I'm already trained to take the heat? Or, you know, I'm going to continue my dilly darling until when Sunday law comes, then that's when I'm going to get serious and an ad as an Adventist. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll go to Elder Mandla before I close. So let's give him the mic before I move on from Monday. Thank you. Uh, two things. The, the first one is what I see here in paragraph 3. It, it's exciting. Let me read it. God is sovereign and overrules events on earth for the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purposes. This is the part that made me read it. Listen. Although at times God alters his original plans based on our human choices, his ultimate plan for this planet will be fulfilled. It seems oftentimes we make God alter his original plan. We fail to fit into it. We make choices that will make God change his intentions. Although he has an ultimate goal for the whole planet, a small me alters momentarily that plan. Um, but ultimately, God protects his church and his people, and his will will be fulfilled. And the second thing I wanted to talk about was that, that chasing of the Romans. So there was, the, the, if you read from the Great Controversy, there was a man that went up and down the streets uh, announcing that the people should flee to the mountains because there is danger coming. For years he did that, and there were signs in the skies that, that showed them that they should flee. One good Christian would realize that if we have a moment in an intense battle to chase the enemy, this is the opening for us to flee, not to defeat the enemy, 
but to flee to the mountains. So God opened that opportunity for them. One who is not informed of the plans of God would rejoice at the chasing and continue chasing. But one who is informed will know that I have chased enough and I've gotten to a point where there is an opening for me to flee. Amen. Amen. And the fact that God alters those plans, that's, that's also, again, the definition of love. Because if he didn't, where would we be? He had to alter those plans because of the bad choices that we made so that we can be saved because he loves us. Right, let's move on to Tuesday. I think that's a wonderful way to close off Monday. I've got five minutes, so I need to move very quickly. Tuesday says, faithful amid persecution. Maybe a question for the church is, when, when the time of persecution comes, and it's very near, when the time of persecution comes, will we be able to stand? Or are we going to be found wanting? Food for thought, please don't answer. I, I need to move on, but think about it. When, when that time of persecution comes, and, and when we say it's close, it, it truly is. It is very, very close. When that time does come, will we be able to stand? Or are we going to be found wanting? When I was preparing for the lesson, I came across a sentence that says, persecution will not test your faith, but it will reveal your faith. And, and, and that for me was so powerful. Um, it actually made me think of, of, of uh, a, a group of friends that I used to have. And, and amongst those group of friends, which, which is normal, right? It always happens. Um, amongst those group of friends, one of them became exceptionally, exceptionally successful. He started his own business, his business flew, and, and he still is exceptionally, exceptionally successful. And, and a lot of the guys in that group used to say, oh yeah, this guy has changed. Uh, money has changed him. And I said, but I don't think so. Money has not changed him. It has just revealed who he is. We probably just didn't know, but it's revealed who he is, right? And that's exactly the same thing about persecution around, around faith, that it will not test your faith, but it will reveal your faith. I just want to add something quickly of Sister White also. Yeah. She says, true character is revealed amidst a storm. Yes. Or in a crisis. Yes. And so we will see. We yes. will see who will stand. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. One more hand for Tuesday, then I'll move on. I know there's a lot that we haven't covered for Tuesday. We haven't read Acts. Uh, we haven't read, I mean, there's Acts 4-7. There's, there's, there's quite a bit that we haven't covered. Um, but I'm hoping that you did prepare for your lesson, so you, you did read those things. So we'll, we'll, we'll quickly move on. I'll take one hand, then we'll move on from Tuesday. I think we're actually covering back and forth, in my opinion, if you will ask me. But I, um, the point I wanted to make is, that's why we ask the question, and I think we always need to introspect. Um, the point is, character is never going to be revealed in crisis. It's never going to be um, um, built in crisis, but it's only crisis reveals character. That's the point we're making. What does that say to me? And that's what I was saying earlier. Are we going to wait until we hear the Sunday law before we are already trained for when the pressure mounts and you're told that you've got account balance X, but you cannot access it unless you bow down. Are we waiting for then? Or are we already so living close to that God such that when we are brought to that state like Job, we will still say, in this crisis where I am, I will still obey him. Though I, I can see, it seems to me I'm finishing. Are we going to be get, able to get to that point where we're saying, even I, my flesh can go now, but I know that I will see him. Like I'm talking about the experience of Job. So we can say it. And someone says, we are good at sitting at Sabbath school and exchanging ideas and talking this. How does that translate to practicality 
And to me, that's what I always battle. The, the fact that we don't realize that we can hasten the coming, we can hasten the crisis so that we can go home by being real Adventists who are not waiting for the Pope to move, but actually doing the work so much so that it infuriates the Pope and we are able to actually be given an opportunity to give that loud cry and experience what it means to be preserved within a crisis and come out victorious and hopefully Christ finally comes. Thank you. Wednesday, caring for the community. And, and I mean, it, it, this also ties into what you've just also mentioned, Sister Elero. It, it, ties, it ties beautifully into that um, because caring for the community is probably a true test um, for us as Christians around the concept of love. It's really a true test for us because we read in the lesson that in the early days, the Christian church grew. So amid, amid the persecution, amid the killings, the, the death, the imprisonment, the church still grew. Why? The church was still growing. Why? The church was growing, and I'm going to tie it into Thursday as well. The church was growing because Christians in those days demonstrated love in action which is something that we are failing to do now. Christians in those days demonstrated love in action. It wasn't a talk shop. They did things. We are not doing things. And, and that is why our church is not growing. Please read Acts 2, 44 to 47. We won't read it now, but when you have time, please read that. It ties, it ties Wednesday in very nicely. And the other thing that I wanted to mention about Wednesday is that as Christians now, we, we don't have a common goal that Christians then used to have. We, we don't have that. Now it's about self. How many properties am I accumulating? How many houses do I have? How many cars do I have? It is no longer a common goal about trying to find ways to meet the needs of the needy. We're not, we're not interested in that anymore. We're not doing that anymore. And, and, and that's where the selfishness and the crux of the selfishness in this lesson actually comes in. And where does that come from? Where does the selfishness emanate from? When I close it up, um, we'll, 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 we'll mention that. Um, Sister Eleanor? I just want to put this thing in. Oh, okay, so. But think about what was our attitude during the pandemic. I know the, the, the lesson highlighted um, uh, cases, you know, similar experiences in the past and how Christians dared to go out there and even lost, got contaminated and died in the course of helping other people. We just had a pandemic. Yeah. We sit on something called the health message. What, how, what was the action when the Lord gave an opportunity for Adventism to shine, to, the, to, the, to take, take the, the, the gold given to the church, to, to shine it out? But the church did practically very little. Exactly. And, and that's, that's the lack of love in action that I'm referring to because it's now about self-preservation. When that pandemic hit COVID, the first thing we all thought about is I need to be locked up at home so I can preserve myself, preserve my family. Christians back then did not do that. They were called to action. When pandemics hit, they were called to action and they moved. And, and I know we, we, we are always saying that when COVID hit, uh, you know, it's signs of the time, signs of the, maybe it was a test for this church to move. Maybe it was a test for this church to show love in action so that we can start drawing people closer and closer to God. And if it was, we failed, and we failed dismally. It might seem, it might seem, are you listening? Yeah, I can hear you. It might seem that we have neglected or not must I tell you what God's words say, that we must eat and chew and hold? Mm. My word will not return unto me void. Whether you spoke to somebody, whether you give a, gave a little thing, 
It's not the way we measure. It's about what you've got and what you give where God's word is concerned. And this is it. The great controversy says that with the COVID thing, it says <laughs> Satan taints the air. Yep. And we read it and we knew who was the master of it all. Whoever ran, whoever thought that they were doing what was best, it's not the best. Because God gave us a long time the warning that this was going to happen and it's not finished happening. And so therefore we need to remember to stand for the right, though the heavens fall. We must live a life. Others will see it. Isaiah 55 is 11. Amen. Amen. I've been told I need to close. I apologize. I've been told I need to close. Um, so, so in conclusion, <laughs> in, in conclusion, where does love emanate from? We know that love comes from God and God is love. Where does selfish, selfishness come from self, the devil? Our love for God is manifested in our love for each other. The love of God, and in closing, I want to say this. The love of God destroys all selfishness because God is victorious. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this powerful lesson study that you've given us, Heavenly Father. Um, we did not do it much justice, Heavenly Father, but we pray, Lord, that as we prepare for these sessions, that uh, you speak to us and that you move us, Heavenly Father. It's time that we have love in action, and it's time that as a church we demonstrate that. Be with us for the rest of the Sabbath, Heavenly Father. Um, grant us a good Sabbath, and may it be a wonderful Sabbath, especially because it's uh, a Sabbath where we have visitors, um, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that they'll be blessed and that they will be changed. Uh, they will not be the same as they came in. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your mercies. Be with us today. Amen. Thank you. Welcome to our visitors. Um, we're going to start our song service, and I'm going to ask Sister Naledi to open for us in prayer. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the Sabbath and for granting us life. And today I pray that as we're about to walk, go into our worship service, that you will fix our hearts and minds on you, that we may sing to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm just going to ask for you to have just a hymn close by, just in case we have challenges with our project again today. Our first hymn will be 245.
showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness. More of His love who died for me. More about Jesus in His word. Holding communion with my Lord. Hearing His voice in every line. Making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness in. More of His love who died for me. More about Jesus on His throne. Riches in glory on His own. More of His kingdom sure increase. More of His coming Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness me. More of His love who died for me. Amen. One, one, Can we all one. have access to the black hymnals, the red hymnals also written, SDA hymn? If you can just um, get those, or we can just use our phones. The next hymn will be 530. Can we all sing? This one is a popular one. 530. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when songs I see belongs wrong, whatever my heart thou hast taught me to say, it is well. Glorious thought, my sin out in part, but the whole is now to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. The clouds be rolled back as the scroll, the trump 
shall be sound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well in my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well. Next team will be five zero two. Right. 
Our next team will be five zero. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Just before I welcome you, I think somebody might be getting very nervous if they want to go anywhere. This is a Ford. I would like a Ford. I wouldn't mind to have a Ford. If you are, if you are missing your keys 
Or maybe it's not the Ford. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I should. Yes, it is a Ford. Yeah. Not too blind. So if you're missing your keys, please, I'm going to leave it here with R12. And then if you are driving a Renault Clio parked on the other side of the road, if you could please kindly go and move your car, there's somebody who would like to leave, and you are blocking them. So if anybody is driving a Renault Clear with GP number plates, oh, thank you, my brother. Thank you very much. Okay, now that the housekeeping is out of the way, we can proceed. Are you happy to be in church today? Yes. Amen. I am so glad to see all of you. I feel like I haven't seen you for ages, and I was just gone one week. Blessed Sabbath to you all. Thank you for choosing Claremont. It's Visitor's Day today. So we expect to have a lot of visitors. The church is very full, so I think we do have, but we only have a few names here in the book. But if you have not had a chance to write your name here, you are most welcome too. We are glad to have you. We actually have a little gift prepared, so all the Sabbath school superintendents, if you are ready... I'm going to read out the names, and we're going to ask all our visitors to just stand up. And I know it's very uncomfortable, but don't worry. I'm going to ask the church to stand up later on, too, so don't feel bad. Okay, and just before we go there, I just want to say thank you so much, Leah, for playing the piano. God is so good. He prepared. He knew we needed a pianist today, and he sent her. <laughs> God is so good. Awesome. Yes. Pray for Sister Diane. She's not feeling too well today, so let's keep her in prayer. And he provided Leah for us. So we are grateful. Visitors, I am not neglecting you. We are glad. We have a special day for our visitors today. We even have prepared a potluck and an afternoon program. But most of all, God has called you to be here today. And he himself is here to welcome you and to bless you. So, our visitors. Our first one here is Emile July. Where are you? Oh, very welcome. Please stay, please stay standing because your gift is coming to you. And then we have Vuyelwa Mbete from Riverside, or Kayalicha. Over there. Welcome. And then we have Lionel Maldine. Oh, Mablene. Mablene. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Welcome. And then Ondele, Ondele Gomba. Ondele, Ondele, Ondela. Oh, sorry. Thank you. And then we have Vuyisa, Vuyisa Nohai. No Welcome. Ana Mathe. Ana Mathe. Welcome, my sister. Prince. Okay, I'm not even going to attempt this name. Whew, there's an X. When I see an X, I get very afraid. Prince. Prince from Westlake. Prince from Westlake? Oh, welcome, welcome. I'm sorry, I do not want to mutilate your name. Um, Mamu Kelly. Mamu Kelly Hindueni. Welcome, my brother. And then we have Mavis Tambala from Maitland. Mavis Tambala. Most well, you are most welcome. And if there are any other visitors, any other visitors, if you have not written down your name, please stand up. And the, no, she's not a visitor. She comes regularly. We, we, we just need to get her to sign her name. <laughs> A few guys who need help. Please stand up. Okay. Now, church members, you were very naughty. You didn't greet the visitors. Now, I saw nobody shaking their hands. Now, you have to all get up because it's Visitors Day. Church members, stand up. And we're going to sing, Tis love, tis love, tis love that makes the world go round. Do you know that? Tis love. Tis... Wait makes the world go round. Thank you.
Well done. Thank you. Let's be seated. Thank you very much. All right. Visitors, I'm sure that you are feeling much warmer now. Make sure to also make them feel welcome during the lunch and after the service. Um, just, um, Tandeka, I'm not sure, are there, is there a video for the announcements? Yes, okay. Welcome to Claremont SDA Church. Happy Sabbath and thank you for joining us today. Be blessed. We urge you to switch off your cell phones as they tend to interfere with the wireless microphone signal. Let's take note of the following announcements. Everyone is invited to join us for potluck and the afternoon program after the service. This Sunday Pathfinder Olympiad Sea Leaders for more details. Ambassadors are requested to remain in church after divine service for a brief meeting with Brother Thaban in Guania. All women are encouraged to register for the Cape Conference Women's Retreat coming up in August. The PM Department is asking all departmental leaders to send their outreach programs and dates to Brother Wilson or Sister Happiness via WhatsApp or email. Join us for our weekly Wednesday prayer meetings at church or on Zoom at 6.30 p.m. Next Sabbath Hospital Visitation Next Sunday Cooking Demo on Healthy, Easy Plant-Based Breakfasts the 27th of April Public Campus Ministry and STASM Rally at Friend of God AGS Goodwood with Dr. Paco Mokwani and Pastor Joseph Gawaseb. Men's Congress next month see Bulletin for more info. World Adventurer Day coming up in May. Those who wish to join the baptismal class should speak to Pastor Brinton Lang or one of the elders. Feel free to add your favorite hymns and choruses, including the hymn book and hymn number to the praise and worship team's box in the foyer. Transfer of membership, get in touch with Sister Shireen or Sister Diane if you wish to transfer your membership, update your contact information or the whereabouts of your membership. All announcements are to be sent by Wednesday 8pm to claremontco at gmail.com. We encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube and social media channels and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on new content. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, just another reminder, all of you who would like to know how to cook vegetarian or plant-based meals, please put that in your diary. Come along next Sunday between 10 and 12. But try to be on time so that you can see right from the beginning. 10 o'clock next Sunday in the hall. It will also be um, live streamed, but it's always better to be here in person. You can also taste a little bit. Our call to worship this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. We'll continue with our worship service at this time. Um, can we put the worship in? Okay, thank you. 495. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. Where sin can not molest, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us Oh, 
sweet me to the heart of God a place where we our Savior meet me to the heart of God oh Jesus bless me Shall we stand? Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the place of the world all around to your throne where grace does abound. May our lives be Transform my love. May our souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. For those of you who are able, shall we kneel as we pray? Thank you, blessed Father in heaven, that we can be back in your house of worship today. Thank you so much, Lord, for your faithfulness. Oh, Father, how we were reminded in the lesson study that you are our God. You have promised us, Lord, that you will be with us in any trial and tribulation that we should face and that you will uphold us with your righteous right hand. What an amazing promise, dear God, that no matter what we are going through, that we have a God who loves us so much, who created heaven and earth, that a God with nothing or with whom nothing is impossible has promised to uphold us. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We glorify you. And sometimes, Father, most of the time, I should say, we are so ashamed for who we are. But, Lord, here we are again with willing hearts, Lord, asking you again, Father, to work in us, to transform us. And we claim that promise, Lord, that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. Father, you said that no selfishness, Father, if we even hold a little piece of selfishness, we can never wholeheartedly belong to you. Oh, dear God, so we give ourselves to you today to ask you, Lord, that you may do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, Lord, you know our hearts and our minds, so we invite you, Lord, to search us and reveal to us what changes that still need to be made in us. Dear God, thank you that we can trust you with our lives, with our future. You made a promise to us where you said that you have plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Father, you are a faithful God, a promise keeper. Lord, there are people here today, your children, Lord, who have come up with a special need. A special need, Father, that needs to be taken care of, that only you know how. So we commit them into your hands, Father. We pray that you may comfort those who have lost loved ones today. We think of Sister Audrey van Squirr's family, Father. We pray that you may comfort and strengthen them. 
that they may know that you have not left us without hope, but we have hope in the resurrection morning. Father, there are those here who are struggling because of unemployment. Lord, we pray that you may be faithful unto them. May they know, dear God, that you said that look at the lilies of the field. Who takes care of them but you? You know the hairs on our heads. You know when a sparrow falls. You know what we need, dear God. May they know that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Father, we commit our service into your hands. Many visitors have come here today, dear Lord, because somebody has given them that invitation. They came here to meet you, Lord. May they not leave this place without knowing that they have met the God of the universe. May they know how loved and how treasured they are by you. I pray for a special blessing upon them today, Lord. And Father, here we have a father and son who will be breaking the bread of life today. I pray, Lord, that you may bless Brother Mandla, Brother Wandi, that you may touch their lips. May they be your instruments today, dear God. Bless them and keep them. And may your spirit direct every word that will proceed from their mouths today. Thank you, dear God, for giving us the special blessing of worshiping you in your house today. Grant us, Father, that special blessing of hearing your voice today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time for our stewardship reading. I'm not sure if the video is working. Is the video working? No. Okay. Sister Sibo says so. Is it you? No. Sister C Oh, brother. I, you see, I don't learn my lesson. Sibu Siso will be doing our stewardship reading today. If I don't know, I should rather not say brother or sister. <laughs> Good morning in Happy Sabbath Church. Um, can you all turn our Bibles to Proverbs 23, verse 26? Proverbs 23, verse 26. It reads, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. And the Lord bless the reading of his word. Today's scripture describes God's greatest interest. He wants our heart, which have turned away from him because of sin, to return to him. We could call it a character's transformation. Um, Ellen G. White once said, I will quote, This tithing system I saw would develop character and manifest the true state of the heart. Testimonies for Christ, for, for, the, for the Church, Volume 1, page 23, 237. This is the true purpose of faithfulness. To develop character and manifest what truly rules our hearts. We need to understand that the use of tithes and offering is one thing. And the purpose of tithes and offering is something, else, is something completely different. Tithes and offerings are used. Sorry. Tithes and offerings are used to advance the uh, cause of God. But the purpose of returning tithes and offering is the development of our character. So when we talk to uh, when we talk about faithfulness in our church or to our children, we shouldn't just argue that God's cause needs resources and that the mission needs to advance and therefore we need to be faithful. What we really should emphasize 
is how selfishness takes over our hearts when we're not faithful to God. Imagine a child receives a child who receives an allowance of ten dollars from his parents and returns one dollar of tithing and another dollar of offering. Over five years, that child will have returned sixty dollars of tithe and another sixty dollars of offering. This money certainly will not cause a great impact on the preaching of the gospel. It will certainly cause a great impact on the preaching of the gospel in the world, but is capable of causing a great impact on the character of, of this child over five years. What is most important to, uh, to ask God is not the monetary difference about offering will make, but the difference it will make in revealing where our treasure truly is. Therefore, I am faithful not because I will get something back, not because God's cause depends on me, but because I understand the role of faithfulness in transforming my character. Um, and the deacons and deacons that's an offering. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Our, our Father in heaven, we'd like to thank you for this day of giving us. We'd like to thank you for being with everyone that gave and those who didn't give anything. Uh, please uh, bless the offering that everyone gave today. Please uh, bless the preachers that will be speaking today that when we leave this place, we say God truly is today. I pray in your precious name. Amen.
it's time for our children to collect their brown money offering. So please um, take out your buckets and baskets and go collect your offering for today. And then we'll have the children's story by Brother Mandla. Good morning, church. Are you happy to be in church today? So then let's try it again. And you say good morning with joy and energy, right? Good morning, church. Morning. Yeah, that's better. I would like to pray for our service before we start. Okay. Let's close our eyes. Okay, so God also hears silent prayers, right? <laughs> the only one who doesn't hear silent prayers is the devil, right? You should know that. Okay, right. So today's story, I thought I was going to tell it from up front there when I'm preaching because it's part of the ceremony, but I'm going to tell it now. So um, it's a story that came out in the late 80s, early 90s in the Ritas Digest. There was a girl, I've forgotten his name, so we are going to have to give her a name. I've forgotten the name, it's an old story. What do we give the name? Um, ah, this class, uh, I, like, I like a class that's checked up. Sarah, right. So the parents of Sarah, the mother had been pregnant. How long do people get pregnant, by the way? Oh, yeah, you do know that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So she had been nine months pregnant and they were expecting. They had already prepared a room for Sarah. Everybody was happy. It was their first child. And um, I think they knew it's going to be a girl. So what colors do you think were in the room? Pink. Okay. Pink. Okay. Did anyone say green? 
Okay, right. So the, the room was pink and they prepared everything, the curtains, the covers, everything was beautiful. Then the time came for the mother to go to the hospital to deliver Sarah. So they went with the father and they were there and the mother was in labor. Do you know what labor is? What is labor? <laughs> What is labor? Okay, so the mother was in labor. The mother was in labor for a while, and then the baby came out. And when the baby came out, she didn't cry. She didn't cry. The father was close by. One look at Sarah, the father was disappointed. She turned backwards, and she was walking in disappointment, complaining, throwing her hands all over. Do you want me to demonstrate what she was doing? What the father was doing. You want me to demonstrate? No, you were not, you were not participating too much. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate. He turned around, looked at the face and went, Oh, no, 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 God, no, why? Why, oh, why? He was complaining, pacing all over. The doctors tried to calm him down and say, 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 no, no, leave me alone. No, 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 no. This is not okay. This is not okay. He complained and moved about and was so sad and his face was so sorrowful. Do you know how to have a sorrowful face? Uh, someone show us a sorrowful face. We need a sorrowful face. Okay, all of you, sorrowful faces. Sorrowful faces with a smile. Okay, so the face was so sorrowful and sad. And then the story comes out. Sarah had an advanced case of what they call cleft and leaf palate. So cleft palate and cleft lip. So it is the top lip and it is the palate on the upper part of the mouth. It was cracked wide open. And it was a terrible sight because it extended right to the nose, distorted the whole top lip, distorted the nose. It was like a terrible wall that was staring at everybody. And it wasn't a pretty sight. It was difficult for Sarah to grow up. So they thought, what should we do? They thought of surgeries. She was too young for surgery. The doctors couldn't perform the advanced surgery. And they said, we are going to perform a surgery when you are 10 years old. So she had to wait for 10 years. Every time she looked at the mirror, it wasn't good. She started going to school. Do you know the most meanest people on this planet? Who are they? Okay. The children, someone said, yes. The children are so mean. Have you ever seen mean children? I know that they're not part of mean children. Is anyone here saying, I'm a part of the mean ones? I can be mean. I can be mean if you want to. Okay, some children are so mean. She would go down out to play and they would tease her for her face and laugh and make it a game. She was uncomfortable to go out. She was uncomfortable to stay home. She was uncomfortable to look in the mirror. One day she made a prayer. She said, Jesus, I would like a new face. May I please have a new face? And then she felt it in her heart that Jesus has promised me a new face. From then on, when people would be laughing, she had this hope that in the future, she's going to have a what? Come and talk to me. She's going to have a what? A new face. She lived with that hope. Everybody would laugh at her, and she would just respond by saying, one day, I'm going to have a new face. When she looks at herself in the mirror, she would look at that, try to smile, couldn't see the smile properly, but would just say, one day. I'm going to have a new face. So the 10th birthday came. She had to travel to another city for the operation. She traveled there. The best of the plastic surgery surgeons were there to deal with her. So they gathered together. They planned her face. They planned what they were going to do. They started the process. It took more than 10 hours. She was in surgery and they were reshaping the face, reshaping the nose, doing everything until they were done. And when they were done, the face was covered in bandage and nobody could see the face. Nobody could see her face. So the parents came in and they saw the bandage and they told her, keep the bandage for the next two days. So she kept the bandage wondering, what do I look like? 
what does my face look like? What am I looking like now? So the day came to take off the bandage. She asked everybody to leave. Please leave the room. Leave the room. This is my hope. I want to see my face. She started undoing the bandage patiently and slowly. And there on the mirror stood a beautiful young looking Sarah. The nose are now shaped. The lips are shaped. The great hope has been fulfilled. She's got a new face, tears running down her eyes. She starts to thank Jesus. Thank you for the new face. And then she smiles for the first time. She can be able to see a smile. Smiles from here to there. Smile, smile, smiles. You wanted to smile when I wanted a serious, sad face. Smile now. Some of you can't smile. You have gas. Right, smile. Come on, smile. Right. So she smiled for the first time, and she could see her smile, and she thanked Jesus for the new face. Now, for 10 years, she lived on hope alone. That she's going to get what? A new face. How many years of hope? 10 years of hope, looking at that terrible face, hoping for a better face. We also have a, a, a great hope that we have. Does your Bible and my Bible say that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall what? Ah, oh, you don't know that verse. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. You didn't know it. Ah. Okay, okay. It says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. Right. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be changed to be caught up with Christ together to the kingdom of heaven. So we are looking forward to that when we shall be changed, when we shall look like Jesus, when we shall go to heaven. Who wants to live for that hope of being changed? Unless you like what you look like. Maybe some people like what they are, so they don't need any changes. Maybe the changes are not just the face. Maybe the changes are also the heart. Maybe the changes are not just the heart. Maybe the changes are all the bodies that we have. Some have diseases and some have different things, but we shall all be changed. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. Who wants to live with that hope of change one day? Like Sarah living with the hope of a new face. Can someone pray for this hope that we have to live for? in the coming future. Who wants to pray for this hope for all of us? The children are lifting up their hands. They are saying, I want to have a new life. Um, shall, we close? shall we close eyes and pray? Thank you, Lord, for the stage you've given us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the story that we've heard today, Lord. Be with us, Lord, and may you put it in our hearts and our minds that we live for the hope of being changed in your second coming. We the children, you've seen the children lift their hands up today saying we want to live for that hope, Lord. We want to see the change, Lord. In your name, amen. Shall we stand? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame that only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to valley's rest, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. 
On Christ the Son, in all Christ and all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Where's all this carbon and blood? Stop what we win the world we fight. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the Son, in all Christ's hand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, clad in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the Son, in all Christ's hand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just see. Sister Penny and Brother Andre walked in. This is Auntie Audrey's daughter. And I just want to express on behalf of our church our deepest condolences to you. Auntie Audrey will be sorely missed. She was a big part of our family when she was here. I remember the two of us used to live in Milneton together. And we would take turns to drive. I would say, Auntie Audrey, I will come and pick you up for prayer meeting. She said, no, 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 Shireen. I have a car, you have a car, so we'll take turns so that we can both use our wear, of, wear and tear of our cars. She, she, she always wanted to be fair. And everybody here would remember when she, she would like, she liked to speak coarser. And so that is how many people remember Auntie Audrey. So may God comfort you and strengthen you. He always knows best. And we know that we trust his timing. So may God bless you. Next week would have been her birthday on the 21st. And we are going to have a memorial service right here at Claremont Church. What time is it, Penny? Sunday afternoon. We will tell you more on next Sabbath. So. May God be with you. Our speaker for today, you heard him in the children's story. Well, well one of our speakers, you may stand up, please. <laughs> Brother Wandi, this is the son. Father and son, they decided to, to be the empty vessels today to be used by our God. They are from Riverside Church, and his name is Ole Wandi. All the time. Oh, you see. That's why he said to me, just call me Wandi. <laughs> so may God bless you as you speak to us. We are looking forward to the message that God has laid on your heart. So just before they speak, we have a special item. So the group that sings with Brother Mandla, can you please come to the front? We are going to hear a special item at this time. One, two. One, two. Thank you. 
just a weary pilgrim Gliding through this world of sin Getting ready for the city When the saints go marching in Saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, oh Lord, I want to be in that countless number, when the saints go marching in, go marching in, my Father loved the Savior, what a soldier he has been, but he serves to be more steady when the saints go marching in, go marching in, when the saints go marching in, marching in, when the saints go marching in, go marching in, oh Lord, I want to be. In that common place, the man with the saints go marching in, go marching in. Up there I'll see the Savior, who redeemed my soul from sin. With the tender hands you greet me. When the saints go marching in, go marching in. When the saints go marching in, marching in. When the saints go marching in, go marching in. Oh Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in, go marching in. Good morning, church. Indeed, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? So you heard from the children's story that we are talking about hope today, right? So I was given this topic. Um, Friends of Hope, uh, PM Day, the PM leader asked me to talk about Friends of Hope. Then I chose the subheading, Jesus is the answer. So we are talking about Jesus being the answer. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to try and fly through what we have to present to you today. In the interest of time, uh, I would like you to, to, to try and write down the verses and references that we'll get so that you will revisit them and see how much hope there is for us and um, learn a little bit of how you also could be a friend of hope and carry hope to those that are hopeless. That is what we'll be talking about today. Jesus is the answer. Hope. So Adventists, we are, we are very good with definitions, right? If I were to ask it to go around now, and I ask that we go around and define hope and how it is different from faith, I'm sure I will not preach. So this is the mistake that I often make. I like to listen to people talk. I, I like that we have a conversation most of the time. So I usually, when I'm about to preach, ask people to talk, and then I end up not preaching. So I'm not going to do that today. But I'm going to ask you to smile a bit, because I'm trying to have you smile so that I can be comfortable up here. It's not easy to be here, especially when the church is angry. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, so Hope, I, I went to Wikipedia because it's the easiest place to find a definition, isn't it? And said, what is Hope? So it says, Hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large. So hope is a positive, optimistic outlook to the future. That's what hope is basically what it is. So as a verb, its definition include expect with confidence or to cherish and derive uh, to cherish and a desire with anticipation. So that's how hope is defined. To have a future outlook, to cherish something with anticipation, to look forward to something happening, to positively expect it to come right. Not a difficult concept, right? Or oh, how hopeless we spend our lives in. How much this feeling eludes us. How much this outlook eludes us in so many things that we do, that we live our lives with a state of hopelessness. We look to the future with so much discouragement to the point that we mess up the present because of the fear of the future. Am I right? So, so often at times we fail to live up to our measure because of the discouragement of looking at the future. So we do have probably some matriculants here that are going to be writing metric this year. Because they are looking at the coming exams with fear, a daunting task that's before them. They even fail to prepare now. They even fail to study. They have no hope of ever becoming uh, uh, matriculants that are successful. So they are already discouraged right now. We have some university students that are going to be writing exams at the end of this semester, if we are at the beginning or where, I don't know. Universities differ. But they already look at a module and the lecturer with that kind of a face. So I must speak like that because I'm a lecturer, right? Uh, with that kind of an eye that the lecturer doesn't bring any hope at all and there is no hope for me in this module. Well, speaking as a student, I sat in class where the lecturer spoke through and I had nothing. The whole semester. He was speaking, but I wasn't hearing. I could comprehend his voice, but I couldn't comprehend what he was saying. My state was a state of hopelessness, even walking into that exam. I did not walk with confidence. I did not walk with hope. I walked with fear and anticipation of failure. That's not hope. Hope is anticipating success, anticipating a good outcome, looking forward to a good outcome. And this world hates us and does not give us such opportunities. If you are going to think that this world gives you such opportunities, you are in the wrong world. That's where I think the term you are in your own world came from. Because if you are in this world that I'm in, it does not like us and it has no hope for us. There is nothing hopeful for us. All outcomes are play and they are wearisome. They are not desirous. If we look into the future, there is not any great hope at all. If you think about how this world will end, the most dangers that are around us with all this degradation in the environment, there is no hope for this world. I don't know, maybe where you stand, you see a lot of hope. When I look at the outlook of this world, I don't see any hope. We have people that are dangerous, even lying in wait to take advantage of the weak at work in life everywhere. There just isn't enough of hope at all in this world. There is so much hatred. There is so much seclusion and, and, and there is so much of it that there is no hope at all in this world. In fact, some people have given it three categories that the situations that give us hopelessness in this world are categorized under attachment. Attachment is where you hope for physical proximity, where you hope for intimacy and emotional bonding, for spiritual unit. Right. Do you see how we are already failing? We speak of spiritual unit. Are you serious? We divide ourselves up, uh, among the haves and the have-nots, even in church. Right. 
we divide ourselves among those that claim to be pretty and beautiful and handsome with those that claim to be ugly. We divide ourselves by those that are tall from those that are short. Those that can sing best and those that talk the song. We divide ourselves in so many ways, those that can preach and those that can't even stand a sermon. We divide ourselves, we are already divided. There is no hope of any bonding, of any togetherness in this world. And yet some lose that sense of attachment. Maybe by alienation, people just seclude you and put you separate. Maybe because you are different from them. They just put you in your place right there and you feel you belong and you lose hope because there is no attachment. You may say, no, me, I'm fine, I can be alone. You are just lying to yourself. The maker of this world, the God who is used to saying this is good, said it is not good for you to be alone. Right? He said so. He said four times in the Bible, it is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. Then he turns around and says, this is not good. So the first time God said something is not good is that you are alone. You need to be attached to someone. You need to form relationships of bonding. Hopelessness comes from people that are alone, that have no attachments, that are left on their own with no one to care, with no one worried about them. They have been forsaken. Maybe it's children. Maybe, maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a relative having been forsaken, left alone, Without attachment, they've put that category one. Category number two that they've put is mastery. Hopelessness because someone cannot master anything. You feel that you can't amount to anything. You probably tried a program, you dropped out. You probably took a job, you left it for another one. You feel that you can't master anything. It's difficult. Your hope has been dashed because you, are, you have not accomplished anything. You have no productivity. So I'm here and I'm feeling I'm, I'm, I'm going towards the, the, the retirement now and I still don't have anything. Really, if I were to write a will, what would I put in my will? And then that dashes my hopes. It destroys my outlook for the future. I have no better look for the future, and I am discouraged, and I have nowhere to turn to because I lack any inspiration to achieve anything. I have no creativity. I find that I'm powerless. Maybe I've been oppressed. Maybe I am limited. I feel limited. I feel incapacitated. I feel unable. Then my hopes are dashed. Are you still here? Right. Situations of hopelessness. Hopelessness because of survival feeling that I can't survive. I've got so many challenges. Maybe they are physical. Maybe they are emotional. Maybe they are spiritual. So much anxiety. So much loss and fear. Failing to build resilience for anything. Feeling a sense of being doomed. A sense of being a captive. Helplessness without hope, buried down under, feeling I will not survive this, threatened my very core of existence, my very existential self with an existential crisis can bring hopelessness. Some with chronic illnesses, some with chronic stress, Others called lifestyle diseases. Some with chronic stress, you keep going back deep into that dark wall. Someone once described it to me. She said to me, I think we need to have a program in church, maybe an office for people that will do counseling. Because when I'm here, I feel like the ground is shifting underneath me. I feel like I'm continuously sinking down, going deeper and deeper, and light is disappearing from above. I'm reaching out to my hand, but I'm grappling to the air, and I feel like I'm sinking down deep in my heart. I feel my heart sinking down. I have no sense of hope at all, and I do not know where to turn to. She was talking to me directly. She had lost her husband. Sense of hopelessness. 
And then you will find yourself going back into that state where you feel worthless and you feel like there is no reason to live. There is no future. There is no hope in this place. Where can I tend to? What will I do to get out of this slump that I'm in? We have a lot of things that can cause us stress, a lot of things that can cause us to be discouraged, and some stresses lead to chronic illnesses because now you will have ulcers, now you have a clinical case of depression, and then you have emotional turmoil that's never ending, and uh, you have depression itself, and some people look at you and think, nah, 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 it's just, it's not, it, you're not serious. You know, how can a big man pull blankets when it's so hot? You are not serious. How can you sit and just keep poking your phone and play games only? Can you stand up and do something useful? And the person is in a state of hopelessness, depressed, discouraged. And they think the best thing they can do is to play bubbles on the phone. So much hopelessness in this world. Loss of loved ones, loss of families, loss of jobs, loss of cherished relationships cause hopelessness. Medical conditions, some medication can give you some gloom and agony. Relationship changes when relationships change. Trauma and sometimes denial of childhood childhood trauma or trauma as it is can cause hopelessness. There are so many things that can cause hopelessness. Even living in sin, even struggling with sin, not being accepted, not being loved, being different can cause you to have a sense of hopelessness. Even being secluded for being different. Has that ever happened to you? You get into a place because you are different, they just seclude you. They just set you apart and there is no way of coming in. Those things will lead to hopelessness. Now, this is why Jesus asked in Luke chapter 18 verse 8, the last part of it. It says, it starts, I'll read everything because I don't like to cut, do shortcuts on the Bible. It says, I tell you, that will avenge them speedily, speaking of something else. Then he asks this question. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Does not your Bible and my Bible in Hebrews 11 verse 1 say, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Right? With a good outlook of the future, we can have faith. With the good knowledge of the one who is in the leadership, we can have faith, right? And so suffice it to say, Christ asks the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Can we have faith? Because the devil is buffeting us with all these things with one goal only, to destroy the image of God and our faith in him. All these things that surround us, the difficulties of life, the challenges of life, they all have come for one goal from the enemy of souls, to take Christ out of the equation. Are you with me, church? Christ is being taken out of the equation daily by all these things that we, you've, you've been living like me. I've been, I've been a vegan for close to 30 years now, from 96, I can't count. How many years? 28 years, right. I've been vegan for 28 years. Imagine I get cancer. Imagine I get cancer. I, the vegan, who's been preaching veganism, I get cancer. Imagine that. Imagine what I'll be miserable like. Imagine what I'll be feeling like, let down by God himself. That's the aim of the devil. That's what he asked for when he asked for Job. And do not forget that when he was given permission to Job by, for Job, he brought down a storm. You remember that? It was a storm that he brought down. And so what becomes our solutions for all these problems? How do we solve all this? What do we do to solve all these things? So some people tend to entertainment, binging. I'm not lonely. I'll binge. I've got five movies. I'll be binging. There's no reason to be hopeless. I can binge. Some tend to sports like me. I'll be supporting my team. I'll be cheering them on. And then they lose. All right. <laughs> right. Some tend to parties. Some tend to traveling. Some think that fun 
will knock, inoculate the problem of hopelessness they have. We tend to so many things which we think will take away hopelessness in, in, in the name of entertainment. Some tend to science and technology. They look for medical solutions. They look for gene therapy. They say, well, I know in my medical history there is cancer. If it's identified early, blah, blah, blah. They tend to medical uh, uh, solutions. Yes, sometimes these things work. Sometimes temporarily. Sometimes they work for a long time. They do work. Some tend to, 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 to meditating. I will meditate. I will meditate. Yoga. I will do yoga. Some, some tend to say, well, I know that I cannot have a baby. What do I do if I don't have a baby? Surrogate. I look for surrogates. Artificial insemination. Well, in the past, Abraham could intend to surrogating, right? He tried that and God said, take it away. And this child, away, away. I couldn't, I'm not saying surrogating is bad. Listen to my direction. You get it, right? I didn't say that. I'm not saying anything else is bad. I'm just telling you what we think are solutions. Right. So some people, instead of kneeling down to ask God to say, give me a child, because what I learned is that when God wants a strong man, he closes the womb of a strong lady. So that the strong lady will pray hard with the husband so that they will get a strong child. Ah, no, no, no. We are not going to pray. We have science in our corner, there is technology. I will take my eggs, freeze them when I'm young, so that if, if I can't, and then we'll artificially outside. We will, we will do our thing, man. We don't need Jesus. Where does he fit in here? We can do our own things. Technology tells us that we can remove him from the equation and do what we can do, when we can do it, how we can do it by ourselves. We can get rid of hopelessness. We have solutions for these things. We have artificial intelligence. We have so much. We have so much at our disposal. This world of today can totally take away Jesus. And we have no other answer but what we have. People have tried to solve all these things. They can tell you of this root and that thing and sociology and psychology and philosophical approaches. Others will tend to activism and say, well, women are under attack, GPV, and so I will stand on the streets and fight against it. Or even in church, black people are being marginalized in church. We are going to stand up against that. Or they speak of a white Jesus will stand for a black Jesus. Activism is a solution to hopelessness. Favorite with so many people that we take a lot of other things that float about and make them a solution for our problems and tend to things that are temporary to fix a permanent problem. I'm here to tell you this morning that there is only one answer for this world. When it comes to a problem of hope on this earth, there is only one answer. Jesus is the answer. I want you to know that you can try all things. It's well and good. Some of them will help you. But you need to know that if you need a permanent solution for any problem that you are facing, Jesus is the answer. Because when Jesus comes in, he does not only provide hope. He changes you from within to without. If you thought the problem was on others when you are losing your hope and the problem is in you, Jesus knows how to get to the root cause of all problems. Jesus is the answer. You may think that technology is the answer. I have a surprise for you. The answer comes from Jesus because he is the one who inspires technological changes in the brains of men. He is the one who is at the head of all scientific discoveries. Though they don't believe the discoveries come from God, I just want to tell you that it is God who made all those things to be what they are. It is us who just discover them. Well, as I have said before, education is just a discovery of your ignorance. The things were always like that. You just didn't know. So it's not shocking that now you know. They were always so. So God made all these things amid all scientific discoveries. I want you to know that Jesus is at the helm of all success in this earth. Without Jesus, we are nothing. Without Jesus, there is nothing. Without Jesus, we are just big zeros. Heading to nowhere. 
find Jesus in your life and be rooted in Jesus, you will know what it is to live a life of hope. I want you to know that the solution to all problems needs you to turn to Jesus. If you are to be a friend of hope, you have to have Jesus by your side. Without Jesus, there is no answer to this hope. We may bring you food when you are hungry, but tomorrow you will be hungry again. We may bring you life support when you are dying, but it may fail. But if we bring you Jesus, though you are dead, you will rise again. If we give you Jesus and cancer is eating you away, you have stored your life in treasures where moth cannot reach. Jesus is the answer to all the problems of this world. You need to turn your eyes upon Jesus. You need to turn towards Jesus, lean on him to find hope again. For without Jesus, there is no hope on this world. Jesus is the answer. He is the answer. Whether you are deep down dark and you are in a state of hopelessness and there is no future, there is no good outlook for you, turn to Jesus. He is the source of all hope. He is the source of all glory. He is the one who knows where you should go. Did he not say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life? Did he not say, a thief comes only to steal and to kill, but I have come to give life that they may have it more abundantly? Did he not say, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you are attached to me, you will give forth much fruit, and any of the branches that are not attached to me, they will be cut off. The answer is in Jesus, brothers and sisters. There is no other place we can turn to. It is only in Jesus. For all these other things are hope that is without hope. Can you read with me Romans chapter 8, verse 24? Romans chapter 8, verse 24. The other verses I refer to are John 10, verse 10, and John 14, verse 6, and John 15, verse 5. Now we are looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 24 to 25. It says, for we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. All these other things we are talking about are hope that is seen, isn't it? And the Bible says, hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Our hope is rooted in Christ. That's where our hope is. Just before, just before we come to the close of this message, I just want to give you another thing again. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, if we neglect Christ, it says this, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who hate him? I want you to know, if you reject Christ, how will you escape all these things that are waiting for you? The devil is lying in wealth. You will have no strength. You have no power. How can you have a power over a person that can call down a storm? Did you ever hear of that angel that came down from heaven to give life to Christ, to call Christ to life? You heard the power of that angel. You heard of the supersonic speed. You heard that the men that saw the brightness of the angel fell down as though they were dead, powerless. Well, that same power was not taken from our enemy. You can't stand. You can't stand. He covers his designs with a lot of artistic thinking and he covers his designs with a lot of, of colorful gapes. And I want you to know, salvation only comes from Jesus that's why we have this hope. That's why when we turn to the Bible, we get only this hope. And this is the hope that we live by. That if you read through your Bible, you know that there is a city that we are looking forward to. A place that is good. A place where there is no sin. A place where there is joy. I want to go to that city. Do you want to go to that city? I want to go to that city. Would you love to join me to go to that city? They are going to sing about that city now.
I've been reading my Bible I've been listening to To some beautiful stories That I know are true Of a beautiful country And a city full square Yes, I've been about heaven to go there I have heard about heaven and I want to go there where some beautiful flowers bloom so wonderfully fair I have heard about mansions for beyond compare about heaven, heaven, and I want to go there. I am walking with Jesus, also happy am I, for I want a bright mansion for beyond the sky. It is a building it has beauty to spend yes I've been about heaven and I want to go there I have been about heaven and I want to go there where the beautiful so when the sleep I have about me about mentions for me on your compare I have been about heaven heaven and I want to go there when my day is over I'll be ready to go to the city eternal where pure waters flow. There will be no more dying. There will be no more care. Yes, I've been about heaven, heaven, and I want to go there. So wondrously fair, wondrously fair I have heard about nations for being compared I have heard about heaven, heaven And I want to go Okay. I have heard about heaven and I want to go there. Personally, uh, I also want to go there. I all want to go there and I want to see all of you stay with me. Okay, so hope. Hope. So before I start with my sermon, I, I want to ask you also all a question. Um, when you think about hope, I, I have you ever been so down? So it's not just down, as I'm saying, you feel sad, you know, you just lost in your game or whatever. I'm talking about down, down. Down where you feel like you're sinking over and over. You're going downer and downer. And you try to grab on, you try to climb back up from that hole you're in, but you just keep on finding yourself at the exact same place you've been 
been the whole time. Have you ever felt that way? That way, where it seems like it's hopeless. You've, you've lost all the hope that you could ever need. Well, I'm here to tell you, there is hope. And the person who will bring you that hope is Jesus Christ. So before I start with um, sermon, I just want to read to you guys a verse. Um, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. 11. Okay. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So when you read this verse, clearly it says hope, which is the title, Friends of Hope. So it says here, I, Jesus has plans for you. Plans for the future and plans that will give you hope. When I speak about hope, I, I know a friend of mine who... Um, his parents had a divorce, so he was like in a slump, man. Like I could see sometimes he would be there with me, but he would also not be there with me. Like he would stay off, wandering places. And and one day when we were just alone, me and him, I asked him, "Are you okay?" And we had a conversation. It was kind of private, but um, he said he doesn't know what to do. He told me with his own words, "I." I've just lost hope. When I, you know, how do I say this? When people lose hope, let's say your friends, your your um, family members, anybody, do you know how to help them? Do, do you know how to help them? Because it's it's kind of a hard thing, especially when you're not in the situation they're in. You can't. It's it's hard. You can't just say anything like. It's going to be okay. Because you don't know how they're feeling. You don't understand how it feels for them. That's why I I can tell you a few people from the Bible who, who didn't have to say any words to give someone hope. Let's start, let's say, Esther. Let's start with Esther. So everybody knows the story of Esther. Um, she was a queen now, married to a king. And um, the king's advisor wanted the king to kill all the Jews. So now he had somewhat convinced the king, okay, king, can you please just, so now the king was now, he put the law, he was like, these Jews are dying now. Esther, even though she didn't really have to, she was the queen, I mean, she was in the castle, it wasn't like the king was going to qu- qu- kill his queen, he wasn't going to do that. So she, she was fine, she was living the dream. But, but um, she thought in her mind, no, I can't leave my people like this. I need to answer this call. Though nobody's going to ask me and, they, and I don't need to do this. I need to answer this call. And that's where I get the sub from. It doesn't matter if you have been chosen. All that matters is if you're going to answer that call. You know, um... Sometimes, you know, you think, like, let's say you are, now they ask you to, let's say they ask you to read a small verse during divine service, and then you think in your head, I can't do this, I'm just a teenager, how can I do this, or or you need to, like, let's say, for instance, like me, you need to stand up and speak in front of so many people, you're thinking, I can't do this, look at me, I'm a small child, or look at me and think, what is this small child talking about? He doesn't know anything. I'm telling you now, not all the time yet. Not all the time it's like that. Sometimes you think negative about yourself. Sometimes you think bad things are happening. Or you see people talking and they're looking your direction. So you think, oh, talking about me now. What did I do? I know, man, what did I do? Not everybody's talking about you. Not everything is bad. You don't need to think in a negative way. Have hope. Hope. The title of hope. When I was at home and my father had just told me the title was hope, I was like, oh, now how do I plan this hope? And I, then it came to me, and it's, it's kind of a funny story of how I planned this. 
So I was um, with my friends in school. So now we're talking about teenager stuff. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to lie to you parents. If you think you're these children really are just talking nonsense, sometimes it's true. We, if you hear our conversations, we're not always talking about small things of like, um, let's say we're not talking, we don't talk like these guys about the government and, <laughs> and all that stuff. We, we don't talk about that stuff. We will be talking about video games and, oh, did you see that YouTuber, what he did? We don't talk about that sort of stuff, but we were just talking, having a conversation. And then my friend, he told me about his, um, his um, auntie, I think it was his auntie's mother. So his auntie's mother had just, um, had just been diagnosed with cancer. I don't even know the stage, but I know she, he said it was cancer. And he said, he said, he was, so they are also Christians, so they went to the, uh, to the, to the auntie's um, mother and they were praying for her, they were singing hymns and all that. And then while they were having a conversation, because after all that stuff, they were having a conversation, the, um, the grandmother said that um, it might be rough, but um, she still has hope. And I was thinking, if I had cancer, would I have hope? I, would, I think I would have given up. I'm not sure other people maybe would have hope. But me, it's cancer. I think I would have given up a long time. But when I thought of that, I kind of understood now what the word hope means. And how some people don't have hope these days. And I'm not even talking about people who are outside of the church, people who are doing their own things. I'm talking about people inside the church. Let's say, oh, first go to we we sabbath morning you know we have our suit on we feeling smart now we go to church hey oh that smiles we're telling people hello happy sabbath then they say happy sabbath us is like your seat shall be your it's so much fun until we go home and then as soon as we go home it just hits us all that depression that mask we were hiding all that smiles we're doing now at home we're not even smiling we have sadness we are we're depressed. People hide these things. And some of us, we can, see the, we can see the signs. It is very simple signs. And we see them, but we keep quiet. We are not, we are not answering the call, if I can say. That was a nice pun for me. Um, we are not answering the call. We, are not, we can see that these people are going through such bad things. And we don't want to answer. We are just like, it's your thing, keep it there by you, don't bring it to me. That is not, that is not how us Christians are supposed to be. And if I just want to tell you about spreading the word of God, I can, um, let's say, let's go to Second Corinthians, let's see, 5, is 5, okay. yeah, 5, verse 20, 20, 20. And, okay, let me give you that a second. How is everybody saying? It's good. Yeah. So, um, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, it says, and I quote, We were sent to speak of for Christ, and, and God is begging you to listen to our message. We speak for Christ. Sincerely ask you, to make peace with God. Now, other than the making peace with God, I just want to say, we were sent to speak of Christ. When you go out with your friends, maybe you're going to Kanao. Do you, okay, first I want to ask, do your friends know you're Christian? For the teenagers, I'm not talking about the adults, because of course, I know adults, everybody knows. But the teenagers, do your friends know? On, on, that, on that Friday, when they ask you, can you play that night, they say, come, come, we play, come, we play on the video game. Do they know that you guys, you actually, it's Sabbath time, or do you just make an, up an excuse? Hey, sh it's late. I need to sleep. Do you make those excuses or stuff? Because spreading the word of God is one of the hardest things. 
especially when you in in your mind where you're thinking i can't approach this person like let's say it's evangelism and now you're out with the youth and you are now going and giving pamphlets and stuff you know when i went i was so scared to approach myself i was so afraid i couldn't even approach them. i was so afraid it's so scary because you you in your mind you think what are people going to think of me let me read another verse oh, actually let's since we're on the topic about fear let's talk about david so everybody knows the story of, of david and goliath um the giant was speaking um ill about jesus and david had overheard while he was going out to to his brothers to hand him something and um david heard and now he was he was agitated i would say and was angry and he was like no he can't say that and then he he went to all the all the um all the uh, soldiers and said you you're letting this man speak so ill about our god and uh, i i can imagine it in my head that the that the soldiers couldn't say anything they couldn't they couldn't answer because what are you going to tell a child or you or you going to tell or you going to tell that small child that i'm afraid i'm not going to tell him so um david fought goliath obviously and he won and after that i believe that um the people they had hope they were like ah i can he prayed to god and he was able to do this thing so if i pray to god maybe i can do this and when i say when i think of this i can tell you right now there is no better person to go and ox for anything than to go to jesus christ for he will help you even though you've done all your sins you've done the worst things possibly that you could think of think of i'm telling you even though you've done those things you can still go, go to god and ox god i need you up i really need you and he will answer let's go to romans 10 verse 14 to 15 Romans 10 verse 14 to 15 okay and it says how can the people have faith in the lord and ask him to save them if they have never heard of him and how can they hear unless someone tells them? and how can anyone tell them without being sent by the lord the scriptures say it is a beautiful sight to see to see even the feet of someone coming to preach of the good news people preaching about god or even speaking you don't have to preach like me or my father you don't have to stand in front of the podium like us some people you can see they sing here or some they even reading a verse or even you know going out and and telling them god loves you and i know that that's a bit overused but i'm serious we can just say that god loves you you know the word love is such a strong word that it can change people's minds it can change them to think in a more happy way than they were a moment before have you ever seen someone like if you tell someone i love you don't you see how that that even if it's a small grin they still grin A grin is a grin. A grin is a grin. They still smile and and they and their happiness is like they enlightened. I'm going to tell you this and before I end because time is running out. There is no better thing than having hope for the next. Knowing that I have achieved something and even knowing that tomorrow I will achieve something even better than I did today. is the best thing hope is the best thing to have it is even better than um how do i put this let me put it for the younger children maybe it's it's better than getting your mom's phone when you playing because even i know when you get your mom's phone you yo now you have it cuz now you can play all the games you want it is even better than that as i end off today i want to i want to speak to you are you willing to 
go out to the people of this world and spread hope. To tell them that there is a God up above who is willing to help you and me that loves us. Because if you are, I would invite you to stand with me. Because I am the one. I have said it and I will say it again. I am willing. Are you willing to spread hope just as me? Are you willing? It is important to give your time. time. You take walk to those that are hopeless. But he has directed us to the fact that while the world is hopeless, we are the bearers of walk to them.
Well, when? Hymn number 500. Shall we stand? Take time to be holy. Speak up with the Lord. Abide in Him always. And feed on His word. Make friends of the children. to take this time to be holy, looking to take this time to be like you, looking, Lord, for a change that can only come from you, a true change that works from within to show without. If our friends may in our conduct see you living, it is this moment when you change us that shall make that possible. Change us, Lord, we pray. Touch us, Lord, and make us holy yours. Dispel all the darkness that enshrouds us. Take away the heart of stone that knows not to love, that knows not to feel your presence, that knows not to hear you speak, and replace it, Lord, with your own heart that knows to hear your voice, so that like your many sheep, we may hear your voice. That when you speak to us, we may melt away and become one with you. We know, Lord, hope is only found in you. Help us to find you now so that we can find hope. Help us to open our hearts to you and you find a place to abide in us. Cast away the throne of the evil one who forever sits in our heart to prompt us to do all that is evil, all that is bad. Take him away, Lord. We confess surrender. We admit, we seek, we desire, we long for, 
we cry for, we wish for, we pray for. Please, Lord, fill us now and live in us. Be our Lord and Savior, our Master and King, our love, eternity, our peace, our hope, our guide. And Lord, be our stay, that in you we may abide for good and bear much fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessings we pray, as from thy worship we go away. Guiding life's conflicts all through the day, saving thy kingdom, thy a reminder to our visitors we have lunch together please don't go we want to eat with you so we're gonna meet in the hall Love. We are united 